Hi, we're starting part two of Wedding Superstitions and Traditions. If you missed part one, go back and check it out now. Today we have something old, something new, something borrowed, and something blue, as well as the history of the engagement ring and bridal parties. Get ready to laugh and learn something new. You're listening to Two Monicas and a Microphone, a podcast about nothing serious, seriously. I'm your host, Monica. And I'm the other Monica. Get ready to talk about anything and everything from vampire to color blindness, to pet peeves, to hot dogs. We've got insight or opinions on nearly every topic, and we know you do too. So listen in and let's have some fun together. So now we enter a different culture and a different tradition. I always thought it was really fun. Glass breaking. Yeah, that's always been interested in that. I've never looked up why it happens, but I would love to hear about why you would break glass. How could the breaking of glass, which seems extremely dangerous to me, especially with your foot, <laughs> could be a good luck thing. Right. Well, this is according to myjewishlearning.com. Breaking glass at a Jewish wedding is a symbol that suggests the frailty of human relationships. And therefore, why are we smashing them then? Well, okay, so according to this source, even the strongest love is subject to disintegration. The glass is broken as a kind of incantation. As this glass shatters, so may our marriage never break. Oh, I love that. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, But loud noises are really a time-honored method for frightening and appeasing demons that are attracted to the beautiful and fortunate people. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> there we go. Of course, we must always be warding off the evil spirits during weddings because they right. are very, very attracted to weddings as we have learned. Yes. Oh, wait, wait. Maybe what? that's why there's so many bridezillas and monsters-in-law. Maybe, maybe they need to break glass before. Whoa, 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 everybody. Take yes. it down a notch. Cyanide tablets were taken by the couple. No. At Sinai, tablets were broken. At a wedding, broken glass cuts the covenant. Well, there is one other possibility or one other reasoning behind breaking glass at a Jewish wedding. It also has sexual connotations. Wait, what? Yep. It happens before the release of sexual union, which is not permitted to married couples, but also required of them. Oh, wait. Uh, no, no. So for reading, for I centuries. Know reading. No, <laughs> no, I do not. No, I don't want to know this. All right, friends, if you want the details, you need to go to our website, to Monica's podcast.com because this is a little Wait, more than PG-13. And we don't want to ruin it for you because every time you just have to guess if you want the stomping of the glass, if you want it to symbol, <laughs> Monica, what is the word? Symbolize is not a word. Symbolism? What is the If you want it to symbolize, sorry, Mm -hmm. if you want it to symbolize that a marriage may never break, then don't go and read because I wish I never knew the ancient (laughs) tradition of breaking the glass. Let's just say it has something to do with a woman's purity. Yes. All right. That's definitely PG. (laughs) In Italy, newlyweds smash a vase or a glass at their wedding. It reminds me of my big fat Greek wedding. And don't they break plates? Yes. Yes. Which I usually do whenever I'm frustrated. I don't actually do it, y'all, but you feel like you want to do it sometimes. Right. Well, I love this because in this tradition, as many pieces as the glassware breaks into, it will symbolize how many years the couple will be happily married. Oh, I love that. You'll appreciate this, Monica, because it goes back to Europe, saving but, the top tier of the cake. Oh, re- really? That's a European thing? Yes. And just like wearing white for your wedding originated with Queen Victoria, saving the top tier of the cake most likely originated with Queen Elizabeth. You did this for possibly numbers of reasons. Today, you know, a lot of people eat it on their first anniversary, but she saved hers and served it for Prince Charles's christening. I wonder how she saved it. And I love the idea of using it for that purpose. Well, no, we're talking Queen Elizabeth. They probably had refrigeration. Okay, I would like to make a comment. I really love that she didn't save it for her first anniversary, but that she did it for the christening of her firstborn, which is just really sweet. I have to give it to her. It is. And that led to a tradition of brides saving it for the same the same purpose. And now we just have altered it a little bit. So the, that tradition is not very old then. No. Well, and well, it couldn't be, right? Because you needed refrigeration and freezing. Correct. We didn't want to get botulism. No, I'll take it in my forehead. Happy anniversary. Here's your botulism. Oh yeah. Only in our foreheads, people. That's right. Only there. Well, I love some of those traditions and you know, I did not eat enough of my wedding cake. I should have gone back for seconds. I had no piece. I didn't have one piece except for the one that Zach tried to shove in my face. Nobody 
served it to us or thought about bringing it to us or anything. So I didn't even eat my cake. Oh, that's so sad. I had so much cake left over. And since we were leaving the next day, we just left it. I mean, we had two thirds of the cake left and I wish I had just oh, wow. taken chunks of it home, shoved it in my I face. Did, when I got married, fondant was really huge. Ugh. And I don't know if it still is, but I refused to do a fondant cake and I wanted buttercream. And that thing, the icing that I did get on my face was delicious. And the cake was absolutely absolutely stunning and she did such a great job decorating with just buttercream absolutely loved it and it was beautiful what about you was yours buttercream or did you go to that fondant route i did both and I did you get it shoved in your face or paul's face or how did you do that little part of the ceremony and i had no idea where that tradition comes from yeah i don't either we should look that up maybe i'll do a, an addendum yes um, or if anyone knows they can go ahead and message us post a comment on instagram we were very nice about feeding each other the cake. We have some pictures. It's really cute. We have a cute picture that I love. I switch it out of us cutting the cake. It's so sweet. And then sometimes I switch it out of the one where we're both shoving in each other's faces so hard and we're both trying to win. And yeah, but you I also weren't wearing, wearing like makeup. Yeah, I know. I, know. <laughs> I had so much fun and it was all fun. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, I would never. And I'm like, I would always because it was really fun. Oh, it sounds like fun. No, I definitely wanted no part of that. I loved my makeup and Paul and I were, we were very civil. And Paul doesn't yeah, even like cake. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that was a wormhole about our wedding cakes. Well, so here's another wormhole. I finally squeezed my engagement ring on my fat fingers. It's been a bit since I've been able to wear it. But the engagement ring, where does it come from? Why do we have it? I always thought that it was because if the engagement were broken, the woman is seen as spoiled goods and she could sell the ring in order to live. But that's not really oh, it. Okay, but really why? Yeah, why, Monica, tell me. Okay. I can't believe I don't actually know anything about it. So I found this really awesome website called estatediamondjewelry.com and it has the complete history of engagement rings. According to this website, engagement rings go as far back as early as 1215. It was really due to the long waiting period between betrothal and marriage. And betrothal is basically another arranged marriage. No, but a little, you have a little more say maybe. It meant you were you were taken. You were committed to be committed. To the insane asylum? No, committed to marriage. You're engaged to be married. Well, I was engaged to be engaged. Zach got me a promise ring. I remember that. Yeah. Oh, I love it. And I'll always remember how I was like, did he just ask me to marry him? Is this my engagement ring? This is very small. I <laughs> I'm gonna say yes. No, literally, this is this is my like one year old brain. This is really small, but I don't care. I really want to marry him, but I'm also scared. Did he actually ask me to marry him? Oh, I didn't know about promise rings. I didn't know what this was that he was doing. I remember in the 2000s, promise rings were huge. They were huge and the diamonds fell out of mine. I still have the ring, but the diamond fell out in Zach Dad's work truck. I okay. still have the little ring and, and the diamond's so small I'm sure I could get it replaced. Okay. <laughs> I know someone. Oh, so, uh, that's true. We do. We do. Just so the jeweler. Are, that's a good idea. I have a couple things for her, to be honest. Uh, it, it, I'm notorious for losing them. Monica, now you know something that I love and that is interesting that no one needs to know about things. So I'm really glad that we have a list here about interesting facts about the engagement ring. Did you know that in ancient Egypt is given credit with inventing the engagement ring, even though the official records aren't available. The documentable history of the engagement ring only traces as far back as ancient Rome. So it does go further back than 1215. It, it makes sense because, I mean, the yeah. Egyptians loved gold. The Romans loved gold. It totally makes sense that it started prior. But I guess yeah. 1215 would be more modern history as opposed to ancient. Right. And I think that sometimes when we are connected our histories, you and I find that there's a lot of times a huge gap between ancient and modern. I bet. Well, this next tidbit is one of my favorites because the slogan, a diamond is forever, was part of Marketing Genius by De Beers. Oh, really? Yeah. That's not just something people have always said. Wow. No. Started in 1947. In 1939, only 10% of engagement rings had diamonds. I will go into that a little bit later, believe it or not. Why okay. I think that is. Yeah, so it could have been any other semi-precious stone. Rubies, emeralds, sapphires. I mean, we all know Princess Diana's was a sapphire. But by 1990, the number of diamond engagement rings exceeded 80%. I'm sure that has to do with availability of diamonds, let's be honest. Yes, 
The first well-documented diamond engagement ring belonged to Maximilian of Austria in the Imperial Court of Vienna in 1477. Whoa. But the most expensive engagement ring on record was the ring that Richard Burton gave to Elizabeth Taylor. Get this, Monica. 33 carat Asher cut Krupp diamond worth $8.8 million. 33 carat. I'm unfamiliar what this Asher cut is. Everyone, I have to look that up. Why don't you look it up? It's really pretty. Sorry. Now that I have this laptop, I'm like, things are weird. Oh, so an Asher cut is square, but it's not a square cut. It is a, it is like as if you took the princess and the square and married them is the best way for me to describe it on a podcast. Everyone look it up. Wow. It is gorgeous. Gorgeous. And I probably don't know about it because I'm sure it's never been in my budget. <laughs> 33 carats is quite astounding. I wonder what the, cu- Dude, what the color was. That have been huge. Right? I'm looking it up. I'm sorry. I'm looking hers up on the interwebs. Um, Do it. What's her name? Elizabeth Taylor. Thank you. <laughs> Dude, I couldn't even think of the town's name next to me. I'm just... Well, while you're looking that up, I'm going to jump into one tidbit about diamonds that I didn't know. And that's diamonds are used 80% of the time in industrial uses, which oh, is yeah, a tragedy. They're cutting power. Yeah. 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 Paul likes to ask me every once in a while. He's like, how many diamonds have I bought you? I'm like, not enough. Yeah, but come on. Come on, Paul. I am looking at her ring and it is the entire size of her knuckle down to her hand. It takes up that entire space of just the jewel. That is not with the bands or anything. That is just the jewel. It's from knuckle to knuckle. Both knuckles? Let's see. Okay, Okay, here. Oh, is this yeah. it? Who inherited that it? bad boy? I do. It's I ginormous. Know. That's okay. amazing. So, one of the things that I've noticed, Monica, especially traveling in Europe, is that some European countries, Greece, for instance, Italy, for another instance, they wear their wedding ring on the right hand, not the left. Do we know where the left hand comes from? Well, I was always told that it's because the left hand runs directly to the heart. And in fact, that is where it does come from. And it looks like all the way back to ancient culture. So I don't know what people are doing in Europe unless they're heartless. I'm not sure. Well, it's not that the engagement ring is worn on the right hand. It's the wedding ring. I don't know. I do know that when we had Paul's ring designed, he added a diamond on the inside of the ring because it goes directly to his heart. It's like the heart line. I was about to say, did you also feel like that was a tragedy because no one could see it? Well, now I have a ring, one of Jess's designs, her ox design. And I have an entire inside row of diamonds that no one can see. It's not a tragedy. It's fabulous. It's not. Okay. That's good to know. (laughs) But someone did ask me, like, you can't see them. Why bother? I'm like, because it's awesome. I would have to actually display the ring. I would look at it all the time. because You're going to have to pop a picture of that up sometime because it's gorgeous. Now I want earrings. (laughs) I'm sure you do. Um, A recent study revealed that 28% of women would turn down their proposal if they didn't like the ring. I mean, and look at you with your story and you're like, this is so tiny, but I'll say yes, but this is so tiny. Did you ever really watch Sex in the City? No. Okay. Well, there's this episode where Carrie gets a proposal and Samantha helps, I forget his name. He was like the furniture designer. Yeah. Helps yeah. him pick out the ring and it's a marquee cut and she hates it and she doesn't want to wear it. And Samantha feels so that would be hard. She doesn't want to wear it. I don't really think she loved the guy to begin with. She was still always hung up on Mr. Big, um, but that's right for a different episode. Anyway, but she hates the ring. She doesn't want to wear it. And she finally has to tell him. And then he has to tell her that Samantha helped him pick it out. And I love that. That's good writing. Yeah. How did her best friend not know that this would not be a ring that she would like? She wanted something classic and something ginormous. <laughs> He should have looked to Liz Taylor. He should have, definitely. Now for a short commercial break. Monica, we both know we're getting older, but we still feel like we're 25. And we've taken different paths throughout the years to keep our skin looking its best. I only have happy memories of my days selling skincare, both in retail and to dermatologists. And I love the education I received from that time. But the best 
best part is I made some amazing friends. Nicole is one of those friends. Her effort into research, development, and creating skincare that makes a difference is unmatched. Okay, so tell me a smart solution that Amethyst has developed. What should I be adding to cart today? This brand checks all of your boxes, Monica. It's clean, vegan, cruelty-free, and ocean-friendly. All of that is super important to me, especially the clean part. Let's talk about the Daily Nutrition Facial Treatment Oil. It's ultra-nourishing, lightweight, glow-inducing facial oil to immediately nourish your skin with needed hydration and moisture. This oil quenches the skin and immediately creates skin that is remarkably supple and soft. So where should people go to find all the details on Amethyst Skincare? You can find all of it at twomonicaspodcast.com and that's with the number two and find the link for skinbyamethyst.com under support. Go ahead and let Amethyst Skincare and Nicole's work work for you we move on we just had that great idea about you know famous engagement rings and we're coming up to probably one of the most famous i would say it's the most famous although i didn't know anything about it before this but then again are you shocked i'm not super into jewelry zach has bought me a few diamonds and on monica you're gonna freak out when i tell you this i was like that's enough diamond what's wrong with you i'm i'm a rare bird i guess uh, <laughs> however did at our 10 year anniversary i got rid of my old ring that he proposed to me with and we upgraded from yellow gold to platinum and i had two channel sets of diamonds with my original engagement stone and it is okay. absolutely gorgeous and it's my dream ring i love it and i got it for our 10th anniversary so i have you've seen my ring i have yeah, a lot of diamonds right there on my finger and that feels like enough for me but he has bought me a couple of diamond necklaces and i do occasionally wear them oh my god <laughs> i can't i know i know you can't but i'm i'm sure totally that fine is, totally fine I cannot even imagine as a man what it felt like to be married to me. But anyway. <laughs> I mean, so, Zach gets off easy. Yeah, what? Like he, he gets off easy with you because like he doesn't have to buy you diamonds where Paul asks me if I have enough yet. I'm like, mm. <laughs> I know. I'm like, as extra as I am, I am not that extra. So, all right. So we're going to move on to this ring. It is the Princess Diana's Sapphire fire engagement ring and i will say that it is absolutely gorgeous obviously monica you know what it looks like even though i included a picture here in our notes which now seems silly to me but it is gorgeous so prince charles actually proposed without an engagement ring and he allowed diana to choose her own i have to give the history of this ring because it's really fascinating to me then i can describe it so keeping with royal tradition she did choose a sapphire ring so a lot of the royals had either sapphires in their ring or sapphire rings like you said at one point a lot of people had precious stones instead of diamonds hers was actually a 12 carat oval sapphire flanked by 14 round diamonds. The round diamonds are then set in 18 karat white gold. Now, it does not go from knuckle to knuckle, but I would say it probably goes halfway. Kind of curious to see how much a 12 karat sapphire would go for, but I don't think I'm going to find out. Well, at the time, it cost $65,000 for this ring, but today the ring is valued at $400,000. Now, of course, we know it would be priceless. It was Princess Diana's ring. There is a really interesting history behind it too. So she marries or gets engaged into the royal family and they are flabbergasted. They are having such a hard time with this very simple Princess Diana. And Princess Diana, I feel you girl. Some people don't understand. They just don't understand you. But most royals opted for custom rings, but she, Egads, chose one featured in a catalog. How dare she? Uh, just a disgrace. 
the ring featured in the catalog was designed after a brooch from the Royal Jewels. But the thing is, because it was in a catalog, other people could have owned one that looked exactly like it. Uh, Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, I had a roommate who was proposed to and because her dad was English, I guess her soon to be fiance felt like she'd want something more in the English tradition. So she was proposed to with something almost identical, not necessarily as big. (laughs) Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's illegal to make a copy of it. What I was reading that would not even be allowed, but I'm sure there's tons of knockoff in design, if you will, but can never be the exact parameters. Why doesn't Where this is- say what the carrot is? Okay, so I'm on bluenile.com because this is a wormhole, yeah. right? Okay. And they have a really, really pretty sapphire ring and it's on sale now. It's 40% off. It's $3,900. Her ring with the carrots and the gold and the diamonds is valued like as itself at 400000 Right. So and know. the thing about this one is the sapphire is enhanced. So hers is probably not oh. enhanced. It's probably like yeah. a true sapphire. It doesn't say the carrot weight, which is kind of annoying. Anyway, and it's it's got diamonds all around it. It's really pretty. BlueNile.com. There's another interesting history to this. Okay, so Monica, I'm going to ask you a few questions. One, do you know where that ring is today? It's on Kate Middleton's hand. It's probably in a Correct. safe. No, she wears it. She's never taken it off as, oh, as I far wouldn't as I either. understand. Actually, Princess Di was the same way. Even after she divorced, she wore that ring. It's gorgeous. Now I have a couple other questions for you. I'm just okay. wondering if you know the answers to. Do you think Meghan Markle is jealous that Kate Middleton got that ring? Uh, she might be jealous, but she also understands that the firstborn gets the engagement ring from the mother. Wrong. Guess what? who was willed that ring? It wasn't Harry, was it? It absolutely was Prince Harry. What? So why does Will have it? Because Harry gave it to him to give to Kate. Oh, and well, and I now they're fighting. There's a, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Right. And then there is another ring that he inherited and then he gave to Prince Harry is my understanding. But yes, that could be on Meghan Markle's finger, which is kind of, I'm not going to make a whole bunch of comments on that, but mm-hmm. I like that it's still in England. If I have to buy into all the royal tradition mm-hmm. and go with that, that's where, that's where it belongs, right there in England on a finger doing all of the Englandy things. But it's also kind of ironic because Meghan is a little bit like Princess Di and the fact that she doesn't want to be a part of the royal hubbubbery. Interesting kind of take and you want to want to think about it, but it should be on Megan's finger. It's on Kate. There we go. All right. Well, we're going to digress just a little bit and talk more about what the different stones meant. As we mentioned before, by 1939, only 10% of engagement rings had diamonds because others were filled with other precious stones. And guess why they were filled with other stones, Monica? I'm just guessing cost and availability. No. Oh, well, rubies. what's the the reason? So here's an example. Rubies promise to protect the wearer from evil. Surprise. (laughs) <laughs> well, of course. And an opal promised faithfulness. So you had different yeah, well. meanings with each stone. And it wasn't until the growth of the diamond industry that most rings were made from diamonds. So basically, the diamond engagement ring is like what people try to say about Valentine's Day being a Hallmark holiday. It's marketing that in yes. an industry that really, really pumps this tradition into our culture. And that is just so fascinating to me. Absolutely. So it's It started with De Beers, and at one point, De Beers owned most of the diamond mines in the world. They may still, I don't know. That's another wormhole that I could dig into. Might be kind of fun. I think that diamond mines would be fun wormhole. Oh, yeah. I mean, we could go into... Oh, I mean, the exploitation of people is the part. That, that, that too. That too. And so now everyone talks about blood diamonds and clean diamonds. And, you know, you have lab created diamonds now too, that are virtually indistinguishable, which is part part of a problem for the natural diamond industry, um, because chemically they are indistinguishable. So fast forward a hundred years, if you have a lab created diamond that doesn't have a traceable origin, it could be valued the way a natural diamond is. I think that's kind of fascinating. I do too. 
Monica, we're moving on to the last segment in today's episode, superstitions, the good, the bad, and the strange. What do we got up first? Well, how would you feel if you had a spider on your dress? First. Right? But apparently it's good luck, according to English lore. Who knew? (laughs) Who? I mean, maybe spiders were seen more as something that helped get rid of other pests, unlike how we see them today. I personally love spiders. Not in my house, outside only. Outside only. Here's another one. Seeing the bride on the day of dates back to arranged marriages. And it was thought that seeing each other before the vows would give them a chance to change their minds. And I think we talked about that in the last episode. Like, what if someone was mega Uggs? You'd just be running, (laughs) running, running, running. And that is sometimes why the women were veiled. Yes. And again, bride's being walked down by her father. She hasn't seen her soon to be husband yet. Neither of them have a chance to run away. (laughs) Well, rain on a wedding day, I always thought it was bad luck, but in some cultures, it symbolizes fertility. So get to the honeymoon suite already. I thought this one was really interesting. You bury a bottle of bourbon in the South. So you bury a bottle of bourbon at your wedding venue as a way to usher in good weather. So this is where I think some things are contradictory. In some cultures, rain symbolizes fertility. And in other cultures, you want good weather. So you bury a bottle of bourbon. I don't know. Well, I think that that makes sense. So a long time ago, when a wedding was a very small ceremony, it took a very small amount of time. It was probably very private comparatively. Even if you got everyone there, it was in a village and you had like 25 people bearing witness versus later. And you're talking about a Southern wedding at the time that bourbon would have been in the culture that heavily. These things were big. They cost money. There was food. There was dresses to get ruined. And I think that has more to do with it than anything. All right, I'll buy that. Yes, it's official, everyone. Maybe I would want rain in the morning before the ceremony and then clear skies because we buried the bourbon. I think that's perfect. The best of both worlds. Yes. Here's a very interesting one. Gifting knives considered bad. According to folklore, a knife signifies a broken relationship and it's bad luck to give as a wedding present. If knives are on your registry, just give the gift to give her a penny. Oh, that's funny. That's super funny. Me, this next one reminds me of something we talked about in our other superstitions episode. Crossing a monk or a nun's path on your wedding day means you're doomed with infertility, which I think is so bizarre. Maybe that's because they're celibate. That is strange. Yeah. I mean, they just, people just sat around thinking of awful things that could happen. <laughs> think of how anxious you would be on your wedding day. You're having to dodge evil spirits and even monks and nuns. So bizarre. And what, what if you cross the path of the monk who's going to marry you. No, you can't cross his path. Now you better turn his little monk butt around and go the other way. Lest he be holding a black cat walking under a ladder. But in that case, you can walk back around and or put a cross under the triangle. I don't know, everybody. Go back to the superstitions episode. That's right. (laughs) Um, Okay, what about carrying the bride over the threshold? This superstition began in medieval Europe when many believed that a bride was extra vulnerable to, you guessed it, evil spirits through the soles of her feet. (laughs) Isn't she wearing shoes? Um, I don't know. Okay, maybe not. It's medieval Europe. Medieval, okay. I think they still wear shoes. I don't know. I don't know what their wedding tradition was. Maybe it was barefoot. I'm not Maybe. sure. These evil spirits are really persistent. <laughs> so anyway, to avoid bringing in any evil spirits, the groom carried the bride into their new home. Oh, mm. that's sweet. Did Zach carry you over the threshold? Yes. I don't remember if Paul did. I think he did. I yeah, because it's just fun and cute. Yeah, it is cute. I should have him do it now. <laughs> Last but not least, we have the something old, something new, something borrowed, and something blue. What were your old, new, borrowed, blue? Do you remember? No, I don't remember. Okay. Why don't you ask me? Monica, did you partake in that tradition? What was your something old, something new, or something borrowed, or something blue? Okay. Let's see if I remember. My blue was the blue stone on my garter belt. My borrowed. Mom, that's what? what I did for blue too was on yeah. my garter belt. I couldn't figure yeah. out where else to put it. My earrings were the something new. Paul gave me my wedding present. They're diamond earrings. My old was a pearl ring that my grandmother had given me. Oh, and Monica, your what? grandmother gave you yours. And I remember mine. Now, okay. my grandmother had passed away, so she didn't give me this 
this, but she was um, in to needlework and she had made a bunch of handkerchiefs. Aww. And I took one of those handkerchiefs and put it inside my garter. And that was my something old. Oh, that's so sweet. So to match the pearl ring, I borrowed my mom's freshwater pearl bracelet. Ooh, and that was my borrow. sounds pretty. And if anyone has or hasn't done that, I would love to hear about which ones you did. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, so where does this come from? Wearing something old represents the bride's past. Something new is the couple's happy future. And the bride is supposed to get something borrowed from someone who is happily married in the hope that some of that person's good fortune rubs off on her. Glad I wore my mom's bracelet because I eventually had to return it. Now I want it back, so pretty. But the blue, apparently blue denotes fidelity and love. And I had no idea. I had never thought about why we would choose the color blue other than it rhymed. Old, new, borrowed blue. Monica, that wraps up today's episode. Friends, we hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we did. We had fun putting it together. We had fun sharing all of these traditions and superstitions with you. Please follow us on Instagram at Two Monica's Podcast. You can also leave us a five-star rating and write a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It really helps the show. And we are everywhere you could listen to podcasts. And don't forget to share us with a friend. Until next time. Bye. Today's music was provided in part from pixabay.com. Sound effects by mixkit.co. Other music was provided by filmmusic.io. For full credits and music listings, please see our show notes at twomonicaspodcast.com.